Hi, and welcome to Hiss and Tell, a cat behavior and more podcast, hosted by me, Christina Wilson, animal behaviorist. My guests today are Dr. Maya Gupta and Dr. Miranda Workman, two directors of the ASPCA's Applied Behavior Research and Animal Welfare Team. We're going to talk all about how and why the ASPCA values research so much, publishing grants, and the actual cat research itself, which is super cool. Stuff like house soiling, adoptability, grooming, feral cats, and so much more. Let's get started. Here you go. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Hiss and Tell. I am your host, Christina Wilson, and with me today are two directors of the ASPCA's Applied Behavior Research and Animal Welfare Team. With us today are Dr. Maya Gupta. She is the Senior Director of Research, and Dr. Miranda K. Workman, Director of Shelter Behavior Education and Outreach. And later on, we might have a guessing game about what that K stands for. Uh, welcome, Maya and Miranda. Hello. Thank you. Thanks for <laughs> having us. Clapping. <laughs> you are so <laughs> welcome. Thank you for being here. So do you guys want to uh, introduce yourselves a little bit, talk about how you got to where you are, what your education backgrounds are, um, and we'll just kind of go from there. Um, I'm going to tag you in to start first, Maya. All right. Well, my training is as a clinical psychologist, so actually more on the human side, but I always figured that I would do clinical psychology in my work life and do animal welfare in my extracurricular. So for example, senior year of college in New York, I moved off campus into a tiny studio and fostered kittens and then was preparing to go to graduate school and do something with relationships or maybe dating violence. But I never thought the twain would meet. I was sitting on the one and nine subway uh, one day, uh, knowing I was gonna take a gap year after college, not really knowing what I was going to do. And my eyes lit on a poster for a domestic violence crisis line. And it asked about a number of warning signs for partner violence. And one of the questions was, has your partner ever threatened or hurt your pets? And that was my light bulb moment that I wanted to do something with this the rest of my life. I called every national animal welfare organization I could think of, including the ASPCA, and said, hey, do you need folks to do more research on the intersection between animal cruelty and domestic violence? And they said yes. And so that was how I focused the early parts of my career, did research on the topic, and went up involved with a nonprofit program in Georgia, which was where I went to graduate school and where I live now, uh, that assisted the human and animal victims of domestic violence in finding safety together. So some years later, I wound up moving into kind of broader topics in the realm of human-animal interactions and the human-animal bond. I got involved with teaching for (laughs) Canisius College, which is how I first got to know Miranda. and We've even gotten to (laughs) teach together. And uh, join the ASPCA in this research role that lets me plug into a much broader array of topics in animal welfare. So for an organization that is just animal welfare, not the human piece, but we all recognize that we influence animal welfare through the humans who are connected to those animals. And so Mm -hmm. I would say that the human animal connection is still super relevant in the work. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much for that. Dr. Workman, I'm going to kick it over to you. Yeah, absolutely. That's a tough act to follow. I know. <laughs> um, but I'll do my best. So I um, have been kind of on a parallel yet scenic paths between sheltering and animal welfare and academia. So I've been in sheltering for almost 25 years, if that ages me a little bit, but really started to work on the applied animal behavior side first and in sheltering and and had some leadership positions um, in IAABC or the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants. I was the cat chair uh, for their their feline division for a while. Um, I was president of the Certification Council for Professional Dog Trainers. And then I started realizing that there was a need to build bridges um, between the applied um, and the academic. And so I took that opportunity to jump into academia. My bachelor's degree has nothing to do with what I do now. I did get a master's degree in anthrozoology and went on to teach in that same program. As Maya mentioned, that's where she and I connected. Um, and it's been a you know beautiful friendship ever since. Um, but I really started to um, both teach in the animal behavior program and in that same anthrozoology master's program. 
really starting to do some research um, about uh, cats, so particularly how people are viewing cats online. Um, so, you know, Pet Finder was kind of one of those early websites for people to see what was available um, as far as, you know, who they could go um, adopt and add to their family. So I did some research on that with a Pet Finder paper, collaborated with um, a colleague on how dogs respond to cat-related stimuli, because we know so many families now are multi-species households. And that kind of also leads to my research on multi-species families. So my doctorate um, is in sociology, uh, but I focus on what I call the human-animal environment entanglement. Um, and kind of how they all work together. So my doctoral dissertation is on multi-species families, and then my other passion projects um, really focus on behavioral euthanasia, decision-making and impacts. Um, so that's kind of where it all happened. And then um, as I was taking those parallel journeys between the applied work in sheltering and the academic work, um, then I ended up joining the A. And uh, so there I work in the behavioral sciences team, but I have my toe dipped in um, research uh, still. And so I kind of work um, on that kind of, that, that entangled um, interaction um, <laughs> between the human and the non-human um, still. And so between that and, and doing a few other fun things, I'm on the ICAT care um, feline well-being expert panel. So mm -hmm. love that, that international network I get to work with. Um, so I kind of just like, just like Maya, found a place where they meet um, at the ASPCA. And so I am here and let's take the journey. All right. I love hearing it referred to as the A. I've never heard of that before. <laughs> like, is that just shorthand you guys use there? Or is that something like I'm just out of the loop and everyone calls the ASPCA the A now and I'm a dummy? No, it's internal, I think. Okay, okay. <laughs> so it's like, what, what sense do you talk about? Like, I'm not hip to this new cool kid lingo that you guys are talk about. <laughs> like, good point. But it to say ASPCA Absolutely. and to say the American Society for oh the my Prevention gosh. of Animals. Yes. That, that makes total sense. So I, I totally get it. I just, you know, I, I had to make sure that I wasn't missing out on some type of relevancy that, that I need to know. Um, Cause you know, at 46, I need to really remain relevant the kids. So <laughs> that said, do you guys want to talk a little bit about the ASPCA and how the ASPCA values research and just kind of what, what's going on over there uh, with you guys and your, your team? Sure. Well, how about I start Miranda, you can add any context that I missed. Perfect. All right. Well, because the ASPCA was really founded on the belief that animals are entitled to kind and respectful treatment by humans, we have discovered that by doing and fostering the doing of high quality research, that is a critical tool to understanding how we can most quickly and effectively make that vision and that belief a reality. And so we have found that research is a key element to understanding animal welfare issues, informing our work and the work of other stakeholders on animal welfare issues, and really promoting action in the field. And this is where it comes back to our work being so applied. We're always thinking in our research about how it will get out across what we call the research to practice gap. In other words, if we just put our research in a journal where maybe some folks who subscribe to the journal read it and nobody ever does anything about it, we tend to not be satisfied with sure. that. We're really to get in the hands of shelters mm -hmm. and animal behavior professionals and veterinarians and lawmakers and the public and really the full range of stakeholders that touch or have the potential to inform and influence animal welfare. So to that end, and then we'll jump over for to you, Miranda, do you guys tend to like to try to publish in open access? Do you like, how do you handle publications? Because I know for those of us in academia, there is that stopgap for people. If you're not in academia, if you don't have licenses to read a lot of these journals, you don't have access whatsoever to a lot of interesting research that's coming out. And I think it is really important for people who don't have access to be able to get their hands on stuff for more than the like two week, you know, non embargo period that you have to, to let people see it. So that's a long winded way of saying, how do you guys at the A 
handle <laughs> publishing your research. Absolutely. We have increasingly been tending to publish our research in open access publications or publications that have an open access option. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we do as part of that is we also offer an open access publishing fund for researchers outside the ASPCA who may not have funds in their budget uh, to publish their research right. open access so that we can promote that. In a very few cases where we have target journals that really that is the right journal to reach the key audience who we're trying to inform or whose behavior we're trying to change through the research, we might publish something that uh, isn't open access, but then we will wrap around it by creating a one pager to explain the research on our website, mm -hmm. ASP. CAPro.org by creating job aids, tools, tips, all kinds of things, presenting at conferences, mm -hmm. giving webinars, so that we really help ensure the research reaches the field, which is also why we conduct an annual research forum, which is an opportunity for researchers in animal welfare to get their research straight into the hands of animal welfare professionals, including shelter pros. Miranda, what would you add to all of this? Well, you did an amazing job covering <laughs> a wide range there, Maya. So well done. I would say too, another thing is we are always continuing to make connections with researchers beyond the A too. And so as Maya talked about the research forum, but also our research grants where we are supporting people who are who mm -hmm. are doing that. So there's an applied research grant. Maya knows way more about all the different options. Um, I know a lot more I, about that one. Um, but also I think too is making those other informal connections um, that we have in the, the wider industry. And, you know, things like, you know, telling people how can you access some of these things. And it's, you know, obviously, as she said, pro, and we now have a new platform called ASPCA Learn, where there's an opportunity um, to, to learn about some research um, that's been done because they have things like the Shelter Medicine Conference. It's held every July. And so they, they record those sessions and are able to provide those back um, to the wider industry. So there's a whole lot of really fascinating things. Also for listeners who may not know about the publication process, that it is kind of a pay to play uh, operation, right? So for people who are listening who may not know, uh, there are often, not always, but often a lot of fees associated with publishing your work that can be really cost prohibitive for a lot of people. So I just wanted to put that out there for people who are listening and who may be like, what are they talking about? Why are we paying money to publish our research? You're not getting paid to publish your research? Like actually, no, it's the reverse. You are paying money so that you can publish the stuff you've been working on often for years and years and years. Christina, great point that the general world of animal welfare research is underfunded mm -hmm. in all ways, right? Which goes back to why we have our research grants programs to try to at least place some uh, filling in in that gap. But yeah, it's way different doing research on improving the lives of animals in shelters, what your funding opportunities yes. are compared to doing biomedical research. Abs absolutely, yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I'll add to that too, that we know that that system also limits the voices that have access to the funding mm -hmm. um, for those. And what's great about the ASPCA is we, we value those diverse voices. So we, you know, that's why we have things like the open access grants and, and other grants that we provide through our research arm because we, we know that we wanna raise up those marginalized voices um, so that we get a, a really more robust view of, of the world by, by listening to them. So that's really important too. That's you know the challenges of the pay to play system, um, but there are certainly ways that we are trying to um, dismantle um, the access challenge. I was just gonna add, if your listeners would be interested in exploring more about the different research opportunities that mm -hmm. the ASPCA offers, uh, or seeing some of the one pagers about our existing research or clicking where you can to our, our published papers, you can visit ASPCAPro.org slash research and find everything okay. there. All right, thank you. So perhaps the two of you could talk a little bit about how you guys each came to your work in the cat space. Miranda, you wanna go for it? Oh, right. sure. Yeah, so how did I come to the cat space? I think as maybe some portion um, of cat people uh, started out in the dog world. Mm -hmm. and, and that was me. I, I definitely started in the dog training and behavior space first. And then in my work in sheltering, I really came to understand that 
at that point, and again, this was 25 years ago, there wasn't anyone paying attention to cats um, and their behavior. There really wasn't a robust network right. um, of individuals looking at that. And so I kind of made the decision and I can remember where I was sitting the day I did um, in the shelter going, I'm going to be the cat person. And, and so for me, I just jumped into all things cats. I'm an, I'm a voracious reader. So I was reading everything. I was talking to people, um, really trying to understand that. And then when I came in from the sheltering side, bridging that gap into academia, I said, how do we, how do we make more cat people? Um, and so one of the cool things I was able to do when I was at Canisius in the undergraduate program, um, I actually created a program called Kittens on Campus. And it was a course all about learning theory and, and training and, and behavior. Um, but most people think of dogs when they think of that. And I said, no, we're gonna talk cats. And so we actually fostered kittens from our local um, shelter. And we applied all those same things, right, to, to training with cats. They learned to run a little agility course. Um, their final behavior in the course was always to enter a carrier, which we know is one of the reasons people don't take their animals to the vet, right? Their yes. cats, it's so stressful for the cat and the human. Mm -hmm. So, so we were trying to combat that and, and these cats would go into a carrier on cue and it was just wonderful. We, it, it really kind of told me how important, um, cats can be when we give them the spotlight because they would schedule campus tours when, when class was in session and it was an open classroom. So there was a glass wall where you could watch everything we were doing. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of came to it there. And then when it came time for me to really kind of dig into research, cats, let's do cats. <laughs> so yeah. really kind of like, I kind of just kind of from that first moment at the shelter and then just kind of rode that, um, that uh, theme all the way through into teaching and then into research. Um, and, and maintain that in my applied settings that I was working with too. And, and so even now we have a shelter behavior apprenticeship that we're working on, um, that we've been developing. It's an amazing um, program, but I was always a champion. There has to be some cat focused stuff in there. So I'm like the lead for the cat, the cat module in, in that program. And so it's really, it's just kind of something that I, I made a decision. I've decided to just kind of keep that thread going <laughs> through my entire career. That's awesome. I think until so recently, like cats were just seriously underrepresented and underserved in the research space and just, just yeah. kind of in general that people get dogs. And I guess because you walk dogs and you have to take dogs out where they have to interact with other animals and people, when there's problem issues, they really have to be handled. But people are just kind of like, oh, well, cats just exist in my house and like, whatever, you know, or yeah, there's feral cats, whatever. Um, they just aren't haven't been historically given the same kind of, especially behavioral mm -hmm. importance that dogs are given. And so I love seeing the space change. I think it's really exciting. And like, finally, finally. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you for your years of service. Thank you. Thank you. Most welcome. And Maya, what about you? I think I came into it much less proactively than Miranda's well-considered pathway. <laughs> Literally, I became a cat person because my parents were not animal people. And when I was four, a cat showed up on our back porch. And on day three, my father finally said, feed it. And you know the use of it uh, <laughs> rather than him or her. So then we had a cat. And there was no question of having additional animals in the household. So that cat was my exposure, my connection to animals as, as a young child. So while I, I will quickly say I love and admire all animals and I do have other species, I am definitely in the cat lady uh, sector. <laughs> and the, the point of commonality that I have with Miranda's story is that I too felt that cats got short shrift mm -hmm. in the animal fair space. Even before that, when I moved to Georgia for graduate school in the very early 2000s, I noticed that there were a lot more resources for dog rescue and adoption in the community mm -hmm. than there were for cats. The municipal shelter in our town only took dogs. Cats were sort of on their own. Wow. Um, there were 
cats all over campus, not in the way Miranda had them on campus, but living in the drain pipes and so on, right? right? Around here, I would just find kittens all over the place, like under my truck. Oh, gosh. So I found it a cat rescue because I guess I didn't have enough to do during graduate school, but it was a welcome relief writing a dissertation yeah. you know talking about sort of the the academic and the applied i yes. would write about horrible animal cruelty and domestic violence all morning and then run to the municipal shelter this was in the next county over they had no rescue partnerships mm-hmm. and so uh, my local veterinarian who was the only vet nearby who accepted the discount spay and neuter certificates she and I teamed up and built a, a foster network and would just, you know, pull whatever we could from the shelter. And you know what? College students, many of whom in, in, at the University of Georgia live off campus, mm-hmm. so they could have at least small animals in their apartments. They made a fabulous foster network because a lot of them were missing their pets from their parents' home. That's amazing. Good for you. I love that story. <laughs> That's that's super cool. Good for you. So, Miranda, do you want to tell us a little bit about that pet finder study that you did? Oh, yeah. So, that was um this was one of my master's theses because I did two cuz I'm also like Yeah, why not why add not? more? Let's just do more. Yeah. Um I'm yeah, I'm I'm a glutton for punishment, I guess. Um so my quantitative project was really looking at pet finder and what about um, what is correlated with adoption success? So we looked at all sorts of different things, right? We looked at age because age is always reported on pet finder, right? So we're looking at the age, we're looking at kind of what information is provided, whether it was male, female, we looked at um, how are they looking at the camera? Um, Is it direct eye contact? And there's some really awesome additional research kind of related in that that space um, from the University of Michigan. Uh, They have some really fascinating how we relate to uh, pictures of animals looking directly at us. Um, And so that came a little later after my research. So it was kind of confirming to see that. Um, We also were looking at, um, you know, what color is the cat, right? There's always this black cat thing, uh, right? Right. We actually found that that might actually be something. And we also looked at, is there a toy? Should we put clothes on the cat? Uh, you know, so we were looking at all these different things and, and correlating what was presented on Pet Finder with what we call the length of availability. So we didn't talk about length of stay because um, mm-hmm. that, that, that then is really how long were they available to the public? And, right. and at what point did they go home? So we were really kind of looking at the, again, this is where Maya and I's our anthrozoology pieces, we're always connecting that human animal um, and looking at how can we represent cats, especially those that may be underserved, right? That, that um, you know, aren't the, the flashy kitten um, that, you know, is the color point, right? How do we deal with that 10 year old black cat? How can we improve their chances? So have them look directly um, into the camera, um, providing a toy, even if they're not interacting with it, was important. We found that was significant. And then we did some follow up uh, a bit later and looked at, you know, we asked some of those people, well, you know, how important do you feel uh, that pet finder experience was in your your selection? Um, And most people said it was, they felt it was impactful and influential. Mm -hmm. So that's really where we we kind of went with that. And so we looked at the dog cat um, interaction piece and we're looking at how dogs um, respond to cat related stimuli. And that one was a lot of fun. So we didn't use a lot of cats, that's not ethical. Um, yep. And we were trying to figure out, okay, how can we, how can we start to build something that shelters can use to identify cat friendly dogs? Mm-hmm. Um, and so we didn't get as far as we wanted, but what we did find was that there were two particular instances that jumped out in our research. So we had a mechanical cat and we had dogs from the community. So these are dogs, we know their histories with cats. And so we started there. And so we had cats or dogs that were friendly and and interactive with cats. We had ones that just coexist with cats. We had ones who had actually injured and killed cats in the past. So we really needed to have a wide sample. And, and we had that. So we had our mechanical cat that meowed and blinked and switched its tail and do all the things. We actually gathered urine from cats uh, pre-surgery. Um, and so we had an olfactory condition also, um, okay. control condition. It was really qu- so much fun to do this. And, and what we found in that particular paper was that there were two things jumping out. One is that dogs 
do pay quite a bit of attention to olfactory cues. Um, and the reason that we thought that is that in the control condition, which was a pillowcase that also moved, because it had a toy in it that would move around, and we put the olfactory, like the urine on that, they were going, whoa, this is smells like a cat, but it's not a cat. Right. Um, and so the amount of time they were spending investigating, trying to make sense of that cognitive dissonance was mm -hmm. really kind of fascinating and statistically significant. Um, the other thing is we found is that dogs that had a history, uh, a not positive history with cats um, in the past, that when we did um, auditory conditions, so the sounds of cats mm -hmm. meowing, you know, all those things versus the right. control condition of coins dropping. What we actually found is the dogs that had experienced inappropriate interactions with cats in the past, maybe had killed or injured um, or chased, right? Not, not, in a, not in a fun, playful way. <laughs> Yeah. Um, they spent a lot more time trying to find where the cat was um, in that auditory condition. So, again, even though it's a dog cat, we are trying to improve chances for cats here. Um, sure. By hopefully being able to identify some cat friendly dogs. And so it's not it wasn't an end all be all. There's still more work needs to be done there. But again, it's like Maya was saying, it's all these connections. If we're doing yeah. research about cats, we need to look at all the interactions with cats. And that includes other species. No, absolutely. And I am wondering also if Maya, and I'm putting you on the spot here, so you can totally just say, absolutely not. Um, if with your psych background, you can speak a little bit to the piece of the eye contact and uh, the toy being important to people. Is it, you know, that, that eye contact, I know we, we value that so much. Cats do not care for eye contact. That's actually aggressive in cats, but, but we like it. Um, it's something I have to explain to my clients all the time that like, please don't look your cats <laughs> right in the eyes all the time. They think you're really being a, a jerk. Um, and then the toy also, are we just signaling that that's fun? Like what's going on with people needing those things? You know, my friends over in the cognitive psychology realm have done a lot of cool research on human attention to uh, facial features mm -hmm. and, you know, human attribution about uh, photo interpretation. And so I can't speak for all of that field of research because it's really big and really cool. And there are a lot of, uh, you know, computerized paradigms that can actually scan where the eye gaze mm -hmm. goes. Mm -hmm. So they're really looking at information processing. But, you know, thinking about the eyepiece, we know from good old Bowlby, this is a basic, you know, human infant attachment, you know, parent mm -hmm. infant attachment research that, uh, you know, that's been evolutionarily adaptive for um, parents and infants, mothers and infants to have close eye contact with one another. Mm -hmm. So who knows, maybe this comes directly out of our own evolutionary wiring. As for the toy piece... I'll give you more of a, a speculative answer than a research informed one, but I can't help but think about advertising and how if you put, you know, a sports car in the ad with the product that you're trying to sell, then, well, that product must be really cool or, you know, that guy must be somebody I'd want to date because he, look at him, he drives right. an awesome car. And if these are implicit attributions and not something that people would articulate for themselves if seeing a toy in there with a cat sort of connotes well that cat likes to play absolutely or humanizes. miranda do you think that there's any uh, value in that speculation i do um and and there's some really interesting stuff i don't know if this was ever published but a colleague of mine and my dot and my uh, doctoral program was looking at how often pets were in um commercials for um, anxiety medication. And oh. so I don't know if they ever actually published, but but I remember when, when they were looking at this and really trying to understand, like, you know, why are we signaling, right? And there's so much in the research and it's cherry picking it, but still that you're right, pets improve our happiness and mm -hmm. our well being. And so if we can, you know, almost a classical condition to fact, right? If we compare those pets with the anxiety meds, then maybe, you know, people will, will take them. So I do think there's something to that. But I think we probably need a bit more work to actually land on it. But yeah, I think the speculation has some found some, you know, some foundation there. So to that end, should we be advertising cats on Pet Finder with sports cars and pictures <laughs> of like hot ladies in bikinis as well? Or like with beers? Like, should we be putting extra stuff in their kennel cards? Like in the picture, you know, should we just be really loading them up? 
I want to go no. I think cats probably no. have their, uh, they, they can do just enough on their own, I think. That's, that's fair. Cool but enough I think they are. a sad missed opportunity for Photoshop, I think, um, would be fun to put, you know, a cat in like a really corny red Corvette. But I digress. So can we talk a little bit about your, uh, the house soiling and shy cat study um, as the reason that shelters are told that cats get surrendered? This is not a surprise to me as a, a clinical behaviorist. I'd say at least 60% of my clients come to me because of house soiling. Uh, so this is obviously a huge problem for people. Um, and I think generally, with cats, people will just ignore things until it really affects them, right? And house soiling, you really can't ignore, so. Absolutely. Yeah. So we were building a multi-year behavior research plan for the ASPCA. And this was one of the opportunities that I had. Miranda wasn't with the ASPCA just yet, but so I, I had to uh, be the, the one in the corner saying, remember the cats. <laughs> um, <laughs> some cat research in the portfolio, because of course we do a lot of cool dog behavior yeah. research, even some equine behavior research mm -hmm. now um, in our work with uh, horses for adoption and trying to promote equine adoption in general. But um, in order to inform what we really ought to be doing, we said, yeah, what do we think the biggest need is? And we all assumed that house spoiling was tip top of the list, mm -hmm. but we did a really quick needs assessment or environmental scan, if you will, did a poll of the shelters that subscribe to the ASPCA Pro newsletter and said, what's the number one reason cats are coming into your shelter? House soiling, thousand shelters, and the majority said house soiling. And then we said, what's the number one reason they have a hard time getting adopted? And it was because they're shy yep. and they're hiding, whether they're hiding in the foster mm -hmm. home or they're, you know, hiding uh, at the shelter. Maybe we gave them a hidey box, but they're always in it. Right. So nobody ever really sees them. Or they're simply cowering in the back, not looking very photogenic for that <laughs> matter, but let alone when somebody is coming through. So we started with the house soiling study and we're partnering with the Wisconsin Humane Society on that. Mm -hmm. We're just about getting to wrap up data collection, although the challenge is always getting the follow-up data um, from people who have adopted yes. cats. So we're looking at three time points. We're looking at what people who are relinquishing cats to Wisconsin Humane are for house soiling reasons are saying about the house soiling. Does the cat display any house soiling behaviors while in the shelter? Mm -hmm. And then for cats that are adopted from that shelter, do they display house soiling in the new home? And so what's going to be really interesting in the data analysis is to look at whether there's consistency right. across the time points. So if you have the hypothesis that at least a decent chunk of house soiling is environmentally driven, mm -hmm. then we might not see so much consistency. But of course, we have a labyrinth of interrelated issues, right? right? Including binary issues and other sort of medical problems. And as a psychologist, I should say, we know the medical and the physical, uh, sorry, the medical and the psychological can be closely interconnected. So what we haven't done with this one is do sort of extensive veterinary workups mm -hmm. with each of these cats. And um, that was a decision that was, we, we were really at hand being able to really look at uh, lower urinary tract disease, crystals, et cetera, might have helped inform our understanding. And on the other hand, most shelters don't have the resources to do extensive, right? No. I mean, extensive veterinary workups on each cat. So we went with the existing level of workup that that shelter is already doing. So some basic urinalysis, um, figuring that that would help make the, and any recommendations that we can derive from the findings a little bit more translatable for shelters to put into practice. So a little too early to have uh, concrete findings yet, although it is looking from early data analysis like we might be right that a lot of that behavior is situationally bound, but uh, stay tuned for the rest of the of the scoop. I'm so, ooh the scoop. I like your pun. <laughs> oh, good good the job. Puns. Love them. Very oh, good. It's always good, good for pun. good puns. <laughs> Are you collecting any um, data? I know this. This is probably it's probably not possible for you to do for animals who have been su surrendered, but I I personally would be very interested in looking at what the the litter box setup is like in the home that they were soiling in versus 
obviously what it's like in the shelter versus then what it's like in the home that they go to. What is the substrate? How many boxes are there? Where is it located? Are there other cats that are bullying that? You know, all of the different environmental issues that can contribute to this. But also you can learn so much just from the pattern of soiling. So much of that can tell you what's going on that that would also be interesting to learn, but obviously you wouldn't have those data, I'm assuming, since they've just been relinquished to the shelter and people probably aren't coming in with Excel spreadsheets like I keep on our cats in their bathroom <laughs> behavior. We did try to strike a middle ground of all of the data we would like to have with what the shelter was already collecting mm -hmm. on this form. Um, we are trying to get a little bit more data at follow up though about all of the variables sure. you mentioned. Uh, the part of the challenge being that now we have, I believe, 300 variables in a data set. Oh, so for any fellow research geeks listening, this presents a challenge because more data is not oh, always no. more analysis. Oh. Right. Data reduction is the name of our game yeah. a lot around here, especially since a good chunk of the behavior research and, and research in general that we're able to do at the ASPCA uses leverages, I would say, existing data sets mm -hmm. from the hands-on work that we're doing, which is so cool to have such a gold mine yeah. of data we can extract insights from. But sometimes knowing where to start uh, is the biggest challenge. <laughs> I, I can imagine. <laughs> like we want all the things, but sometimes all the things makes it a very diluted uh, message. And so sometimes, yeah, it's hard, but necessary. Can you guys tell me a little bit about the Davis Nail Trim Research Grant? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take this one. And this was um, a group from UC Davis that's headed up by um, Carly Moody, who is an assistant mm -hmm. professor there. And she um, had responded to our RFP for the Applied Behavior Research Grant and was awarded the grant. And so what they're looking to identify is can they create a step-by-step -step protocol that will reduce the stress for both cats and the humans for nail trims, right? Something that is mm -hmm. necessary, it, it in, incurs handling. Um, so all those things that often create right in those moments yeah and so can we create a protocol that is simple that is effective that can be taught to anyone so volunteers right so we don't have to just go to the medical team and do nail trims right yeah. um because that's that's often whether that's in the shelter or at home you know people go to the vet can you trim my cat's nails well can mm -hmm. we make this better for everyone and that's really kind of what they're looking at so they have uh kind of three groups that they're looking at. So they have um, one group that they get some kind of pre-nail trim handling work. So, mm -hmm. um, and I won't go into all the details, but basically teaching some consent. Um, so the cats can say, hey, let's step onto a mat. Let's, let's start interacting, let's do this. There's also a handling only protocol. So they don't actually do the nail trim. They just do the handling. And then there's also kind of a control group where it's just the nail trim. Right, so none of this, this pre-handling work. And so what they're looking at is if we are inviting cats to engage in cooperative care, mm -hmm. um, is that going to improve welfare? Is it going to reduce stress? Um, and so they're really trying to understand that. And then can this be incorporated into enrichment programs? um in shelters and again whether that's in the shelter in a foster home um and can we you know, right and if we can start kittens off this way like right it's kind of yeah. where i was going my kittens on campus right like getting into the mm -hmm. training going into the carrier this is another version of that things that we need to do so um jennifer link who's the phd student working on this particular project has been spending her time going into the shelter uh and and just doing all this. So they're in them, they gather data. They're at the point where they're going to start doing some coding of the videos because everything is videoed. Um, and so again, as Maya was saying, stay tuned. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll get some recent uh, research clips, haha, <laughs> nail trims, uh, my own one, um, coming up soon uh, about the effectiveness of, of the protocol. So yeah, I, I'm excited to see what they, what the results. Yeah, I'm, ex I'm excited 
just to hear that somebody's doing research about cooperative care in cats, because that, again, is something that I don't feel like we hear a lot about. We're really glad to see more research on grooming in general mm -hmm. with cats and with animals. You know, this is something that the ASPCA has invested some of our own service resources in recently. So we hired a groomer, started doing grooming uh, in for free to the community in conjunction with vaccine clinics. What proportion of the very, very severe cruelty cases we work with in New York mm -hmm. through the partnership with the NYPD, just what a high percentage of those animals had some grooming related issue, whether it was extremely severe strangulating hair mats, not to be gross, but sometimes, you know, even to the point of self amputating the limb, mm -hmm. traction, alopecia, et cetera, which isn't to say that, you know, Fluffy and Jane are going to get to that stage. But the more that we can do preventively, which really raises the question of, can we also teach uh, some kind of adaptable mm -hmm. strategies for cat owners who may not have any behavior expertise? Since we also asked, well, what have been the biggest groomers, uh, sorry, what have been the biggest barriers <laughs> to you know, having your animal groomed or grooming your animal yourself. And it won't surprise either of you that behavior was one of those big factors. Absolutely. Yeah. I was, I was going to bring up, um, using uh, pharmacological interventions sometimes with animals, especially mm -hmm. around going to the vet or in some cases around, uh, grooming or other things. Uh, I like to use trazodone, uh, but I know a lot of vets, uh, like to recommend gabapentin. And I just wanted to talk to you, Miranda, about your research around gabapentin. Yeah. So it's actually not mine, but one of a colleague, uh, oh. a colleague of mine. Um, so actually a colleague of mine on my team at the A and a colleague, um, on Maya's team at the A, the two of them, um, actually teamed up to look at uh, a very specific population, which is cats from hoarding cases. And mm -hmm. in that particular study, um, what's really fascinating is we do know, especially we're seeing, um, at least anecdotally, I believe, more and more of these types of cases, because we do know during COVID there was a, a gap in care um, for spay neuter, et cetera. Um, and the ability to get that done for, for many reasons. Um, and so now we're seeing maybe some of the repercussions of that. So as we're taking in these large hoarding cases, um, often they're, they're resource rich cases, right? The cats stay in the shelter. They have a longer length of stay. They are some of those that are right often fearful. And so what can we do to not only decrease the stress, but improve their opportunity for adoption by getting the, the meds on board and then doing some behavior mod. And so Maya, at that point, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk about kind of some of those results of that study um, and, and where, where this might go. Yeah, super exciting. So um, what Bailey and Karen uh, found together, our, our respective colleagues, was that a daily dose of gabapentin, and they did this at uh, 10 milligrams per kilogram every 12 hours. So uh, doing that dose of gabapentin for these cats from the hoarding environments, first of all, it improved the behavior modification score. So doing this as an adjunct to behavior mod, reduced the time latency uh, that it took for cats to emerge from hiding after uh, everybody left at night and reduced urine suppression. So back to talking about <laughs> pee. Uh, in other words, these cats peed more in the first three days in the shelter than the placebo cats, which was good, right? Because some research shows that cat stress and urine suppression are correlated. Mm -hmm. And then with the post-adoption surveys, okay, same challenge as I was describing with the house soiling, right? It's hard to get that follow-up data because people who are happy are like, I'm not going to respond to a survey. I'm good, right? right. And sometimes who are unhappy or like, I'm not going to respond to a survey because I am ashamed or, or maybe I don't have the cat anymore. But at any rate, um, while they didn't have enough post-adoption surveys completed to really be able to compare, uh, the treatment environments were reported in the data that they did have to show either social or super social behavior in that home at one year post-adoption. So we're looking at a lasting effect, which is really That's cool. Awesome. We want to improve yeah. their welfare in the shelter, but also downstream in their lives, right? Absolutely. I love to hear it. <laughs> 
So I'd love to talk to you guys about the feline spectrum assessment. I can talk today. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what that is? Yeah, so this actually is some uh, some kind of the historical research that we have done. So historical in the sense that it, it has been a while, um, but still impactful. And mm -hmm. so the feline spectrum assessment was a, a series of papers um, out of a project where we were trying to understand what what kind of factors, what, what um, observable behaviors can we look for to identify um, whether or not a cat is feral? And that's kind of how mm -hmm. they went into the project. So what they actually used were cats that um, were from homes. So they didn't just go straight to the shelter population. There's, there's several um, steps in this study um, that looks at, you know, cats in the home. So we have behavior histories on them. Then we looked at cats in the shelters and looked at cats in the, in the home after that. So there's a whole lot um, of data. Mm -hmm. And basically what this comes down to is, yes, there are some behaviors that can actually identify cats who are social. <laughs> um, so, so it kind of like actually flipped the coin um, there. So the, this is mm -hmm. the whole thing about science, right? Is that you go in with a great question and you design and you use your methods, um, both in your research design and your, your analysis to, to answer the question. And sometimes the answer you get is not what you expected. That's the whole point of asking the question. And I right. think this is a great example of that. So they identified um, a small list of what they call one and done behaviors. So these are behaviors that you see this in the cat, you're done. Yes, this is a cat who is socialized to humans. So it doesn't mean they're roly poly, super snuggly. It means that they have a history with humans. And so they have some ability to understand interaction with us. They also identify kind of a subset, which is called the four or more behaviors. And that, that group, you need to see at least four of those behaviors to come to the same conclusion. And what's nice is they, they actually have, re they repeated this. So it wasn't, this isn't, isn't a one point in time. This means right. as the animal is adapting and habituating to their environment, we know behavior changes, right? Especially mm -hmm. cats who are so environmentally sensitive. We've mentioned that before. So if we do this at, time a and then we do it later in the day at time b and the next day you know similar time for the the third one and we can, can do this they did it over three days um so four presentations and that's what they found so i think that's really really cool now what this has done is spurred more interest in how can we do some some feline behavior assessment in the shelter so even though they were asking, is this cat feral? Um, they weren't, their, their data didn't, wasn't able to do that. But what it can right. do is help us with the other side. And that's still really great info. So now there are some other researchers who are in this kind of practice to research gap. Um, Dr. Ellis um, from the Toronto Humane Society is one. Um, and she can find some of her cool things on ASPCA Learn. She spoke at Shelter Medicine Conference for us last year. And mm -hmm. she really has done a lot of her, uh, most of her doctoral work was on feline behavior assessment in shelters and starting to say, okay, well, what is the purpose? This has really driven us to look at not just what can we know, but what is the application of what we know? And, and so she is, is a, another one that has some really great um, things to say. Like I said, go to ASPCA Learn it and I'll let her speak for herself about sure. um, feline behavior assessments. Um, but she also authored a chapter in our shelter behavior uh, textbook, which we shelter behavior for veterinarians and staff. Um, and there's entire sections on cats, right? Uh, this is the thing that excites me is that we had a question. We just did really good designs and we didn't <laughs> get the answer we expected. Um, and so we are still working on this, but what we do know is, is there is clearly, we talk about feral, we talk about that as a species level thing, right? But mm -hmm. then individuals can feralize. Um, and so all of this is kind of, it's wrapped up in levels of analysis, all these cool like data things. But in general, what we've learned is cats will tell us stuff. They will give us information about how comfortable they are interacting mm -hmm. with humans. Um, we need more research to keep refining that as we go. And that, that Absolutely. was really foundational in, in starting that, that journey for all of us. So how would, and I, I'm asking this for everyone who goes on the internet, who's listening, who may have at one time commented, 
that's not a feral cat or this cat is feral, right? I feel like I see that all the time online whenever anyone says that a particular cat is feral. There's like a whole bandwagon of people jumping in with their opinions. Does the ASPCA have a uh, definition of what is a feral cat and what is not a feral cat? That's interesting. We've moved away from even talking about feral and not feral cats, and we've moved to talking about community mm -hmm. cats along with a chunk of us field. And so we say a oh, definition of a community cat is one who is unowned, outdoor, and free roaming, meaning that they can be socialized desocialized or unsocialized. Mm -hmm. And we have found that that approach has been more helpful for us in some of our community cat work, mm -hmm. our shelter work, and our work uh, in policy, uh, trying to, you know, get better policies in communities that will allow for high uh, intensity trap, neuter, return, and monitoring to try to decrease community cat populations over time. Mm -hmm. or policies that will allow for people to monitor, feed, care for uh, outdoor cats in their area without getting in trouble right. with the law. Um, and then similarly on the shelter side where, you know, in our work with shelters, we often observe cats that come from known groups of community cats that are perfectly friendly mm -hmm. and socialized. And so uh, using this more individualized uh, cat by cat assessment has just been way more helpful to us than sort of blanket definitions of what's feral and not. No, I, I completely see that. And I think that we kind of forget how much weight language carries and what kind of stigma comes along with that language or definitions that mm -hmm. we may place on animals, people, things, uh, and and what kind of consequences that may have for those animals, people, things, etc. cetera. Uh, so I think that's really wonderful to hear. I love the idea of just using community cats because I think when people hear feral, they just kind of, their hackles go up and they think, oh, oh no, mm -hmm. like, that cat's gonna claw my face off. I don't want anything to do with it. When in reality, that's often not the case. So I think that's that's wonderful. And I hope that that message really spreads and we can stop using uh, this kind of like out outdated language around around cats. Um, so in language and, and I, I am so like I'm a side socio linguistics person. And so for me, um, it's also what is contributing to the meaning of a word, right? Mm -hmm. And so feral is often circumstantial. It's, it's based on circumstantial evidence, right? That they're not in a inside of a home, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a difference between looking at circumstantial contributors to a meaning versus behavioral contributors to a meaning. And there's some really fascinating, I'm just going to throw a tidbit out there, really fascinating research that was featured at the Shelter Medicine Conference last year uh, from Dr. Malini Suchak about the concept of bonded cats. And that one, I think, is groundbreaking. And so, you know, that word alone and the impact that that word has, um, I'll leave that as a tease for another moment. But, but again, it's that how we're using our language around cats is also incredibly important and it impacts their lives. And so mm -hmm. it, we should, I think we really should take care to think about what how we're using the language when we're talking about cats. And that's why changing from feral to community cats is important. Um, looking at what are behavioral indicators of things versus circumstantial or, or environmental indicators of things. So it's uh, I think that's important. I agree, I agree. And we've already seen so much research in dogs, I feel like to this end about, especially about dogs and shelters, like removing, you know, breed specific uh, names from, you know, kennel cards and, and all that kind of thing, like things that are suggestive language that may make people not want to adopt certain dogs. Um, so it's nice to hear that maybe we're getting there a little bit with cats. <laughs> so more, more power to that. Um, and going uh, more into adoption for cats, can you talk a little bit about uh, fee waived cats? And, and how uh, you've moved the needle in that field? Sure, this work predates our time at the ASPCA, but colleagues who came before us uh, really started the, the trend in ASPCA research to use research to debunk what we thought were probably mm -hmm. myths in the shelter and kennel fair more broadly. And so certainly one of the big beliefs, you know, sort of uh, accepted truths was that 
if you give away an animal for free from your shelter, all sorts of horrible things are going to happen, um, all the way from those animals are going to be less valued, less loved, to they are going to be targets for, you know, horrible maltreatment at the hands of humans. And so our predecessors did uh, some research to look at whether that was in fact true. Um, so had a shelter uh, voluntarily be willing to eliminate adoption fees. And so this involved, you know, recruiting shelters that were willing to try something new, perhaps with a little bit of a, a financial incentive for the costs that, that might be occurred in, uh, incurred in doing so. Because let's be real, that's another very real worry is shelter sure. funding. So if I'm going to waive adoption fees, where's my revenue going to come from to take care of the other cats in my care? Um, but we found that indeed uh, attachment to, from the, the shelter that we used for the study did not decrease at all when fees were eliminated. And um, basically eliminating these fees did not devalue these cats in the eyes of adopters. In other words, a, a free cat has no less value than a cat for whom I paid an adoption fee. And, and really the implication here is that free programs, fee waived programs could help save thousands of cats in shelters who would otherwise either be euthanized or perhaps languish in a shelter for months on end. And so I would say this research has been, along with the feline spectrum assessment, some of the most impactful in moving the needle in the field because we've seen more and more shelters uh, take up this idea, give it a try themselves right. and be willing to see that ultimately it does improve outcomes for the animals overall in their care. That's great to hear. All right. So because we've already talked a lot about um, P, let's uh, take a question from a listener, <laughs> which was, my cat peed on a wall because I was late feeding her dinner. Is this really the reason why? Um, and so, Miranda, perhaps you would like to give your opinion about this PP pee -pee problem. Yeah. Um, well, I don't have nearly enough information to answer whether or not um, this really is the reason why. But what I can say um, for listeners to think about is that we know that a lot of times when we're talking about peeing on a wall, so that's what we call spraying. Um, so it's not the same as eliminating on a horizontal surface and a full, a full urine void. Um, so this is kind of a little like marking thing. What's interesting about this is that there are so many social and environmental factors that can contribute to whether or not this happens. And usually it means there's some sort of stressor in the environment. So something that as is creating some uncomfortableness um, for the cat. Now, whether or not the cat was hungry because they didn't have dinner and it was late, I don't know. That's probably not um, the likely outcome um, for most cats. But again, there's always outliers too. So uh, I can't really say um, if that was why the cat did that, but I would certainly be looking into what might be stressing the cat in that environment and see if we can either remove or at least um, kind of devalue or, or you know, the stressor, make it a little less impactful. Um, so look around your environment, um, look around uh, your interactions. Oftentimes, if there's a multi-cat situation, sometimes we see this, or a cat-dog situation, or, you know, there's all sorts of things. I've seen where, like, there's been um, outside noises um, that stress the cat, right? So we see those cats, if you're in an environment where you may have outdoor cats who come around um, and you're indoor cats. So yep. it could have been that just that timing happened to be what it was. And so the human went, oh, I'm going to connect these two things together. They may not have been connected at all in the cat's mind. So yep. I would say, I don't know <laughs> is, is my answer. Um, but those are all the things to think about. Yeah, I would say cats don't generally do things out of spite. I think as humans, we think that cats do a lot of things out of spite because humans do things out of spite. Uh, animals really don't do that. And also I would ask, has this uh, female cat uh, been spayed? Because a female cat spraying is, is pretty unusual. So I would say, have they been spayed? If not, let's get that done. Because uh, we don't want pyometra or anything like that happening. Mm -hmm. uh, you also don't want more spraying. Um, and then also I, I would really go along with what you said, Miranda. Is there another cat outside that this cat is spraying in reaction to that's often the most likely culprit or a raccoon or yep. something else that the cat's like, nope, I don't like this. 
Um, or, you know, a loud noise, something, something like that. Um, and then also go look at the litter box, see what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, is it dirty? Do they not like the substrate? Um, but I don't think it's because you were late feeding her dinner and it's it's like a spite pee. That would be really, really, really way down on the list as, as far as my concerns would be. Um, and then the last question before I let you guys go is just really quickly, um, does changing the flavor of a cat's food disrupt their routine? Ah, you know, this is a fascinating one because there actually is some research um, surrounding mm -hmm. um, this this question. And what we do know is that cats, what they're fed early, um, is often the protein source that they prefer. So in those first few weeks of, of life, right, then if they're only experiencing chicken-based um, foods, then if that's all they know, and then at five years old, you somehow give them that they need to have salmon, or mm -hmm. something else, um, yeah, that's going to be a bit of a change for them. Um, and that is something that can disrupt their routine, especially their feeding routine. And their feeding routine is related to their activity routines and, and other things. So yes, it can. Um, so ideally, right, we want kittens to have um, a wide range of experience within reason um, of the types of protein sources. And since cats are obligate carnivores, they need to have meat as their protein source. So thinking about uh, that, it's often, it's it's not necessarily flavor all in, it's flavor related to the protein source. That is that is the kind of the kicker here. So Makes sense. we do know that early experiences, again, affect those later um, experiences here. So can it? Yes. Will it always? No. Um, some cats just have a wider palate, just like some yeah. humans, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I, I was a very small palate person for a long time. It took me a while to go, I'm going to try Thai food. Um, and then I'm going to try that, right? So, you know, that's true of a lot of species. Um, but we do know is, definitely yeah. with cats as obligate carnivores, that's important. All right. So I just want to say thank you so, so much to Miranda and Maya for uh, being on the podcast today. It was so interesting. I hope to be able to have you guys back for a part two next season because there's so many other things to talk about. I would be really excited to do that. Um, and just thank you so much for coming on and telling us all about the A and uh, all of the A's research and for being so punny. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We had a blast. Thanks for right. having us. Thank you guys so much. It was wonderful to talk to you. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode or any of the episodes, please like and give us a rating. Also, feel free to share with your friends. We'd super appreciate it if you shared on social media or really anywhere. For cat behavior consultations, go to catitude-adjustment.com. You can follow us on social media at Hiss and Tell Podcast. Music provided by Cat Beats. <laughs>